Thank you. 
participate. Today at 4 p.m., the Fifth Sunday Fellowship with Temple of Praise will be at the Master's Touch Praise Ministries in Temple Hills, Maryland. Saturday, November 2nd, 2024, the Helping Hand Ministry will sponsor their annual Christmas shopping trip in English Town, New Jersey. Day of shopping at Freehold Grace Lake Mall and outlet stores. Donations, $85. Final payments are due Sunday, October 13th. Contact Sister Gurney McNeil, and there are flyers in the vestibule. The church is seeking monthly captains for the months of January and February. If your birthday falls on either of these months and you wish to serve in these positions, please contact the church office. Every Monday evening at 7 o'clock p.m., there will be a corporate prayer and worship with Reverend Beverly Burke and Reverend Mary Folston. The prayer line number is 351-999-3562. You are invited to join us as we come together to seek God's face for healing, deliverance, increased faith, and direction in these challenging times. Look forward to hearing you on the line. All special announcements, requests for graphic design, print requests, must be submitted to the church office on the request forms located in the vestibule. This includes all announcements for the Sanctuary Spring and Bulletin. The 2025 calendar request form will be available in the vestibule next Sunday. All special events must be submitted for approval by December 1st. Reminder, if you haven't registered to vote, it's not too late. Please register and vote. Your voice matters. Amen. 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 We are um, asking that you all keep New South and Rock Baptist Church in your prayers and the passing of Pastor Rudolph White, who went home to be with the Lord on Wednesday, September 25th, 2024. Are there any visitors here today? Church. Thank you. God bless. God bless. We know that uh, we have visitors certainly from the Metropolitan Baptist Church. We are honoring the First Lady and the family here. We are Yeah. 
these gifts and these offerings that we have. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Washington, D.C. area specifically. He's an outstanding preacher, proper God. He, he can get into it. Not a conference in which friends to him. I think he preached more of Jesus than anyone else. Probably other than that back to college. Amen. He, we, we love him and we thank God for him and uh, his love and life and joy. I love all the children. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'm really thankful to see you guys here. I hadn't seen you guys in Charlotte's Bay. <laughs> I think the uh, first time I saw them, y'all were in Arkansas, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they have grown up and matured, looking good, looking like the first family. <laughs> but we thank God for you being here. Uh, y'all have no idea what we're doing and what we're doing. Pastor Parks. Reverend Dr. Parks, as y'all know him. But I got some other names I don't know about. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I've been doing, I've been calling that all of his life, and even his in his adult life. When we talk on the phone, uh, it's a different kind of conversation. <laughs> Amen. But I want you to know that he is a different guy. I would thank God for him and the leadership being now provided at the Metropolitan Church. Uh, we pray that uh, whatever happens here today will be a blessing to this sanctuary and to all of us here. And we thank God for the friendship and fellowship and faith we all share in Christ Jesus. To my lovely wife. And we want to continue to lift up the name of Jesus. Yeah. Our choirs will come and sing, and then following that, the next worship here, we got us an honor of the Reverend Dr. George Lewis Parks. <laughs>
Tell people to go out the Bible spend so many Sunday nights. I got preach every day here at the Iowa Baptist Church. <laughs> on things eternal that hold to God's unchanging name. Time is here with swift transition. Church, I believe those words ring true now that I stand as a 41-year-old millennial. Time is filled with swift transition. I believe that I grew up in what many people call the end of the golden era of church. 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. There was a unique nature that was within the church. There was a type of readiness that we prepared to meet God on the part of the person and on the church as a whole. Time is filled with Swift transitions. Yeah. Ushers, you may retire. I remember when choir processionals were a thing, where the choir would process in yes. on the song, Glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. One more time. Time is filled with swift transitions. There was no such thing as drive-through time-sensitive church. You would hear someone say, let the spirit have its way. The minister would come out of, we didn't have pastor offices, we had pastor's study. The pastor would emerge from the pastor's study and take center seat and when the time came to preach the word it was not called the preaching moment it was called the preaching hour and when the minister would come and stand behind the sacred desk you could see that there was a discernible weight on the minister and it seemed as if the congregation had the very question is there any word from the Lord. Time is filled with swift transition because now the sermon almost feels as if it is a necessary inconvenience. It seems as if preaching no longer takes paramount and center stage in our churches. We have a podium in the middle, but we almost have this type of attitude. Whatever you do, don't preach to me. We have turned the pulpit into a psychiatrist's chair and couch. Maybe we're always looking for seven steps for leadership and five steps to a breakthrough. But the question rings, is the sermon necessary? The story is told of a pastor and his wife. They were having an intense fellowship. Uh, better yet, they were having an argument. They were going back and forth and back and forth. And they could not get to a consensus of what they were talking about. And finally, the wife, the wife said, listen, the Bible says. And the husband responded, who was a reverend doctor, don't you preach to me. May I pause and say that maybe that's the word from popular culture. Whatever you do, don't preach to me. Make me feel good, but don't preach to me. Be there to comfort me, but whatever you do, don't preach to me. But may I suggest this morning here at the Isle of Patmos Church as you celebrate 25 years of pastor and people uh, preaching uh, is still needed. I mean, I say that again. Preaching is still needed. Dr. Taylor said preaching is not just telling people what they need to know, 
It's about empowering them for what they have been called to be. Frank Thomas says, preaching in the black tradition is an act of resistance against the forces that seek to diminish the worth and dignity of black people. Yeah, it's a yeah. proclamation of our humanity and divine calling. Barbara Brown Taylor says, preaching is the art of breaking open the word of God to the people of God. St. Catherine of Siena says, preach the truth as if you have a million voices. It is silence that kills the world. Finally, Peter Dunn says the task of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfort. May I suggest to you life affords us great experiences. However, there's always a need for a word from the Lord. We, we need a word, church, to center us. We need a word to redirect us and point you and I to what is ultimately essential. Preaching keeps us on the path and introduces us to purpose and the transforming power of life. I know we live in a world where there is this heightened suspicion against the church and the preacher, but we still need to hear a word from the Lord. And preaching needs to be a part of our weekly routine power. This morning, I, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Acts 2, verses 14 through 41. And I want you to read that text in your own framework. And here in this text, we have Peter's first sermon. All right? Now, if I had to tag this text, I would tag this text this. Now it's time for a sermon. All right. All right. God could use so many things if he wanted to get his people's attention. We could have used animals dancing like at Barton and Bank. God could have also used the orchestra to communicate his love. He could allow the birds to sing and the birds to preach, but instead God uses preaching as God's stethoscope and scalpel and magnet for people to come to know him. And that's the word here in this text we have Peter's sermon. When you look at the book of Acts, a third of the book of Acts composes of sermons. We have had the great move of God of Pentecost, and the Spirit of God has fallen down in Acts chapter 2, and they begin to speak in unknown tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And now Peter stands to preach a word from the Lord. And this is the question. Why is preaching essential while we're navigating a, a culture that has shrinking attention spans and rocket life? Right. Why is preaching so necessary for the diet of the church? The first thing I see in the text is this. Preaching speaks to our presence. Right. Take notice Just 
great preachers have died before. Wow. Wow. Pray for your all and live that she died. Matt King Carter lived that he died. Yeah. Yeah. Congressman John Lewis yeah. lived and he died. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth II lived a long time. Oh, yeah. And at the end of her day, they broke the scepter to let us know that her reign is no more. She lived and died. We've seen people live and die. Whitney Houston, Martha Franklin. But the good news about the resurrection is not only that Jesus lived and he died, but he also rose up on the third day and sent at the right hand of the Father. Listen to Peter, what he said is his life, his death, his resurrection, and listen to what Peter said, and he's highly exalted. I like that kind of one. He's exalted. He sits right now at the right hand of the Father, making an intercession on our behalf. He's so exalted that he keeps over the balcony of heaven. And it disturbs our conscience. Peter knows that a clear presentation Woo! of Christ yes. is better than presenting himself. Yes. Maybe that's the problem in contemporary church. I said that at our 8 o'clock service, we can come to church and everybody will receive honor except Jesus Christ. Come on, come on, church, we must maintain a keen sense yes. and an expectation that you and I come to see a king. Yes. Yes. But not a king in the England, not a king in some foreign country, but we come to see the king of kings. Yeah. Yeah. On Corinthians tells the story about a couple who came to church. When they came to church, the pastor was out. You know how people feel with the pastor now. They felt a bit deflated. They were tad upset. This was a loving family. And there was a guest minister that was a bit of shorter stature than the resident preacher pastor. Child nudged the mother and said, Mom, where is the man that always stands in front of Jesus? Come on. There was a stained glass window in that church, and the daughter only understood that as the pastor, as the man who stood in front of Jesus. And I say to you, child of God, none of us should want to be the man well, that stands in front of Jesus. None of us, our sitting should stand in front of Jesus. Our positioning should stand in front of Jesus. People need to hear. Jesus, the old song would say, lift him up, lift him up for all men to see. The Father, I bet you good day. A good sermon. The man's serious reflection. All right, all right. Peter preaches, he lays it all out on the line. Listen, this first sermon in Acts, and I wish I had time to really jump into it like I wanted to today. But listen, Peter, this is not a cute sermon. Uh -huh. This is not a tickle your fancy type of message. Peter lays it all on the table. Peter enters, enter, he, he interprets the present. And he introduces them to what they have done. And the text says, and they were cut to their hearts. Wait a minute. Cut to their hearts. May I remind you, Alan Patmos, if you leave here jumping and shouting every Sunday, Bishop Matthews hasn't done his job. It may be too often in the church we settle for candy cane theology and good times. But when you read Peter's sermon, the Bible says they were cut to their hearts. Every now and then, you and I should leave the sanctuary saying, Oh Lord, I need to do more. We ought to be leaving the sanctuary saying, Disturb me, oh Lord. Hebrews 4 and 12 teaches us that the word of God is a two edged sword that it cuts going and coming. And every now and then, you and I ought to leave here 
with a question on their hearts. Uh, may I tell you, good preacher doesn't always give cookie cutter answers. Come on, Maybe that's the problem with contemporary preaching. We're trying to give people cookie cutter answers to complex issues. Okay. I don't know why good people die. I, I, I don't know why two people who come down the aisle and say for better or for worse, and it seems like they only see worse in their I don't know why children die before going to prom and graduating from high school. I, I, I don't know why. But listen, this is the word we ought to leave here asking, Lord, what shall we do? Sometimes that's the only thing that we can leave people with is asking the question, what shall we do? Preaching is not for cookie cutter answers, but preaching is to lead us back into the presence of God. That's all. I came to tell you, good preaching ought to place you and I under God's examination and say, Lord, I'm available to you. Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor. Ought to lead us to a surrendered heart. Good preacher. Ought to lead us to a deeper level of commitment. God bless you, Alan Packer. We're on our way back to Metropolitan this morning. I'm going to let you know I thank God.